States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting is being live streamed by Chelsea Telemedia and posted to the Chelsea Public Schools website for interested community members to access and watch. In person public participation will be taking place tonight in accordance with the Chelmsford School Committee public participation guidelines. Anyone speaking tonight during the public input portion of this meeting has notified the superintendent's office of their desire to speak and has been provided with these guidelines. Upon request, Written comments received no later than 12 p.m. on the day of this meeting will also be read and made a part of the record of the meeting during the second public comment session. Are there any members of the press here tonight? All right, welcome to tonight's meeting. Our first order of business is to approve our minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes from our meeting on February 27th. Second. Okay, any questions or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. Five zero. All right, um, next up we have our Chelmsford uh, High School representatives. Welcome back. It's great to see you. I'll die in here about the luau. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why the Y2K cultural event hosted by the Black Student Union happened on Saturday, March 9th, and was a huge hit for Chelmsford High School students. Chelmsford High School is also engaging in its reaccreditation process, as identified by NEASC, which is the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. They have been touring the school, stopping into classrooms, and meeting with students to learn more about CHS. And also, the CHS Wellness Fair took place on March 6th, and students in grades 9 through 12 took time out of their day to visit numerous stations to have their blood pressure checked, learn the proper CPR technique, sample food and tea, take a turn in an impaired driving simulator, hang out with therapy dogs, and much more. Also, on March 6th, the junior class had their career exploration breakfast put together by Miss Cunningham. Students got to meet two professionals from careers that interested them, all while being able to indulge in a complimentary breakfast. I got to meet with two engineers, and it definitely was a great experience and opportunity getting to dis discuss and ask questions about their careers. And this week is our House Olympics. Each of the three houses, Emerson, Hawthorne, and Whittier, compete against each other by participating in spirit days and events. The Wing House gets a trophy and obviously bragging rights. Yesterday was our House Colors Day, so the color is red, blue, and green, and an art competition where students can submit a logo and a slogan that they feel represents CHS. The winner will have the opportunity to design one of our lovely walls at school. There was also a dodgeball tournament after school, and our winning team came from the class of 2025, my class. <laughs> and today was Luau Day, and an eco cleanup took place during our Pride Block. And after school today was a disc golf tournament. And in case you're wondering what I wore, I wore it late at school today. And tomorrow's theme is Cultural Day. And during Plus Block, there will be a robots race competition and the students versus teacher hockey tournament at the Forum. If you'd like to watch, it's $2 entry fee. And Thursday will be pajama day with family food taking place during the school day. And during lunch, there will be karaoke and just dance. After school will be our grade versus grade basketball tournament with the winning team playing the teachers. And lastly, Friday will be our gold spirit day with student performances during lunch. And next week, class selections will be taking place. So junior class representative speeches will take place on Monday and Tuesday with an election on Wednesday and Thursday for any potential runoffs. And on April 2nd, the Student Council will be running their annual leadership conference with adults representing the law, medical, financial, literacy, college, and business panel fields. This event takes place on a half day, so students will have the opportunity to have a catered breakfast and attend three panels of their choice and have the chance to hear, ask, and learn a tremendous amount from leaders in the various fields. Great. Thank you. I have a question. So normally you have a spirit week during, uh, like around Thanksgiving? Um, yeah, that's during like our pep rally, so we have a bunch of spirit weeks, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. I like that. <laughs> a lot. Nice. And it sounds like it's... A lot of spirit. There's a lot of spirit. <laughs> um, actually, I will say that when uh, we uh, had a chance to meet with two of the people from the um, NIAS committee, um, they talked about um, the student pride. Um, they were very impressed with the number of students at the high school who really exhibited, you know, pride for their school and their community and their involvement in a variety of activities and... Um, whether it be clubs or sports or whatever. So they were very impressed with our student body. Yay. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you for any good sure. news. I have um, good news. So 
Um, like you were speaking about, our NIAS committee is at Chelmsford High School. This is the accreditation committee that is going through and meeting with teachers, small groups, groups of um, administrators, uh, visiting the classroom. So that seems to be going very well with all the spirit that's happening at Chelmsford High School. So I'm sure they're enjoying the excitement that's there. Um, last weekend, um, Dr. Lang and myself Glad to see Annie Kitts. That was by Parker Middle School. We didn't see all the performances, but we heard they were all amazing. The one we were at was exciting, and they did. The kids did a great job. Um, very well attended. Couldn't even get a seat if you didn't get your tickets ahead of time. So that was great to see, and that's what we have for good news. Great, thank you. Oh, you have good news too. I do. Oh, you go first after you. Okay. I, we all have good news. Yep. Great. Oh. Um, last week I participated in community reading. I read to two classes at Center School and one at Harrington, and I really enjoyed doing it. I've done it before as a retired teacher coming back, but this time was the first time I was able to do it as an elected official. So I talked to my, the kids about my you know, continuing interest in the schools. Um, the kids were great, I, well-behaved. I really enjoyed doing it. I did, as part of, when I finished up, ask all the kids if they had any comments or questions about what I did with the school committee, and I did have one third grader who asked if they could have after-school activities at the elementary school. So I just told her I would pass that on. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was great. I enjoyed it. And I really say thank you to the parents or the people who run that and keep it going because it's really a nice event. I did get bumped out of one of my spots because um, Officer Ozzy could only come the time I'd signed up for, so I had to switch my days, but <laughs> I did that for Officer Ozzy. Yes. Nice. It's really a choice. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to quickly say this is actually a biom relevant update too. So um, uh, in, I don't know if anybody had seen the announcement that the sidewalk project uh, for Maple Road going all the way to Westford um, in South Chelmsford is is going to is at least went to the Senate for approval. So it's a three hundred fifty thousand dollar project to extend sidewalks all the way from the Westford border into um, all the way to the biom. So it's going to get all the way to the front door. So. We might actually have some kids that don't have to pay for the bus and can walk finally. So I'm super excited for that. But uh, that should happen hopefully yeah. someday soon. Yeah. We'll just get on Paul about it. That's my only good news, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I did participate as well in community reading. Love doing that every year. And I went to both Element to uh, Center and to Harrington. Uh, both were great, great things. I love it. It always rejuvenates me. The um, second thing is because you mentioned the wellness fair, uh, and I'm the person who goes to the wellness committee meetings. I just wanted everybody to know that this year was especially challenging because it was harder to get folks to participate from the community. And so I want to especially thank the members who did so much work for this. Hannah Barker sat all through the wellness fair as the greeter for our committee. And she is a parent liaison. If any parent out there is interested in the Wellness Committee, reach out, please do, because uh, it really is an incredible committee that only meets four times a year. The folks in the, Katie Sims and Stephanie Quinn were absolutely amazing as the leaders of the committee again. And uh, we cannot thank Peggy enough, Peggy Agump, uh, because it was part of her grant and her very hard work that we had the folks who did participate. And then finally, and a shout out to Nancy Antonelli. She was, and her staff fed all of the people who did participate from the community. All right. It was yummy. I attended as a, one of the other vendors. Yeah. The food was good. Yes, <laughs> very good. She did a really excellent job. So thank you to everybody there. It was hard this year. Thank you. Dennis, anything? Good. Thing. Okay. That's <laughs> a lot. All right. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. All right. So we don't have anybody registered for our pu first public input session. We do not. Okay. So moving on to new business. Great. So the we have a couple of presentations tonight. I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing. Um, first, we're going to hear from the Biome Elementary School. So I'd love to invite um, Principal Jason Fredette and Betsy Dolan, the assistant principal, up. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, Biome, some of the work that's taking place um, this year at the school. Um, this again continues our series of having each of the schools in for our um, meeting each month to talk a little bit about in practice what's happening in their building. So Jason and Betsy, welcome and thanks for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you much for having us. Um, you know, there's always a discussion about what we're going to do with this, right? And we um, go back and forth and people throw out ideas, our school council, our team leaders are all very helpful. 
Uh, one thing that we thought would be really important to talk about this year was the implementation of uh, Reveal Math Program. Sure, Dr. Bayranavan came with a riveting and dynamic presentation, but we'd like to breathe a little life into that and show you uh, some of that work in the classroom this year. So um, we will uh, kind of have a little, hopefully, a little interactive piece for you, too. Um, with, with any good uh, presentation, we really want to ground this in the work that we're doing from our strategic plan. Um, and through our strategic plan, uh, it had been identified, especially K to 8, that we're identifying um, kind of outcomes for students with, in mathematics. And one of the big initiatives in that is the implementation of uh, Reveal Math. And the uh, Reveal Math program was um, one of our final two that we piloted. Uh, piloted last year, several teachers across the grade levels, K <laughs> to five, um, took a program and put it through its paces with their students. And um, the Reveal Math program was really the odds-on favorite and did have um, really a high preference towards that program. Uh, hopefully you'll see a little bit about what we show you and why that's the case and, and how we've seen the impact happening. <clears throat> With the um, Reveal Math program, I think it is built on all those great pieces of research that we like to see, but there were some things that really stood out to us during this um, not just the pilot process, but the implementation of it too, is that um, it really does go beyond kind of just the rote math skills. I think it really lays good foundations for what that uh, the application looks like in real life. Um, I think it's also what we really liked is that, that it has um, a lot of different components that um, really are woven through throughout the, the all the grade levels and that it really um, strives to have um, students come out with a mathematician mindset. And I think that's really important. Um, it's the first really kind of program in mathematics that I've seen that really takes um, you know, a really kind of good look and an effort to implement a lot of social emotional learning into it around um, you know, whether it be anxiety around math, taking chances, um, having an opportunity to um, kind of change your mindset about being a mathematician. And I know most of us who teach elementary or had taught elementary got into that for one reason. We couldn't do math beyond fifth grade, so <laughs> I fall into this group as well um, as I look at that. So there are many wonderful things about Reveal Math, but we're going to focus on three main components, um, them being Be Curious and the Numbers Routines and Ignite. And I'll mention, uh, go a little further into each one of these in the next slides. So the Be Curious is the teachers are fostering students thinking through meaningful discussions and different types of um, curiosity and being curious in their math mindset. Um, those are these four, notice and wonderings, which doesn't belong, is it always true, and numberless word problems. And you'll see um, some examples of this in some of our clips that we have that we'll show you tonight. Oh, I'm on the so. Uh, then on a number of routines, um, going through uh, these are such things as uh, having students estimate with about how much, breaking apart and decomposing. You'll see a little bit of that in one of our clips as well. Finding patterns and make, making patterns, math patterns. Mystery numbers, um, having students do their real math reasoning skills. Um, doing the, which benchmark is it closest to, which is students really working on those estimation and estimating and rounding. Um, and then the would you rather and enhancing their math thinking and really those math, mental math um, skills. And then lastly, our Ignite is really that SEL hands-on um, portion of the Reveal Math program, which is wonderful. It's uh, really students taking chances with knowing that they uh, won't be wrong and really um, encouraging their participation in the classroom. So it's cultivating curiosity, accepting math challenges, engaging with trial and error in their math work, embracing failure, you know, giving things a try, no matter um, if they think it's something that they may not know the answer to, uh, working together in groups and in um, partnerships with their peers. And then the last portion is that Just Play, which is an exploratory part of the math program. <clears throat> now, as we take you into these classrooms, <clears throat> as evaluators or observers of classrooms, there's certain look for is that we want to be aware of when we go in. So we're going to put these on you now. So there is a quiz after. So make sure that we're really attentive during this. <laughs> um, so what we'd like you to look for um, in these clips is the math dialogue that's going on. 
Um, and you're going to see clips from um, that are going to span. You're going to see a, a second grade clip, a third grade clip. You'll see two fourth grade classrooms, and you'll see a kindergarten classroom. So you are really going to see, um, you know, kind of the scope <coughs> of our grade levels. And you'll see also some teachers talking about um, about what they w have witnessed with this program. I also want you to notice the commonalities of, 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 between the grades. And this is a real strength of the program, I think. And, and when we're doing things, these students, these routines that you have, they are the same exact routines that happen um, from kindergarten through fifth grade. So the, obviously the complexity of the material changes, but the kids, as they begin in um, as early as kindergarten, are doing all these same routines, and it falls into all those categories that Betsy was just listening. So when um, you know, there's a math center game, it's always the same five games. But the kids will play those same five games, certainly at a, a varying complexity of it. So that's important to look for, and also engagement. And you hear some teachers talk about engagement, but um, look at the kind of hands-on pieces that you might see. Also want you to look for kind of that um, kind of maybe a table talk between students or other things that um, you see um, some active learning, um, not as much teacher talk and a lot of student discussion in this program, which I think we really value. Can we work with a friend? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so. High school kids. How are they the same? How are they different? You can share either. Remember, I want you thinking of math questions. Ariana, go ahead. Um, they're different because... One, the top one where it shows inches and the bottom one shows centimeters. Here's something new. Nice job pointing that out. The top one is an inch ruler, which we've been practicing a lot. Ariana noticed at the bottom, this is a centimeter ruler. What's bigger, inches or centimeters? Inches. inches are larger than centimeters. So we've been talking about if it's larger, you don't need as many of them. If it's smaller, you're going to need more. Addie R, what else? Um, on the top, um, it only goes to 12, but on the bottom it goes to 20. Yes, Addie's noticing on the inch ruler it goes from 0 to 12. On the centimeter ruler it goes from 0 to 30. Excellent. Ryan, what else? Um, they're the same because they're measuring the same claw on different rulers. Yes, they are measuring the same object. That's important if we're comparing what it is with inches and centimeters. It's the same object. Good. Connor, what else? Um, I noticed that at three centimeters is one inch. Okay, so Connor's trying to figure out how many centimeters would equal one inch. It looks like about three centimeters equals that. We know all different tools, and we're now talking about centimeters. Let's see what they show us. What tool can you use to measure the length of a pen? So think of a pen about this big. Would a yardstick make sense for this? No. No, Ravi, what do you think? Um, a ruler, or if you didn't have a ruler, a probably a paper clip or something. Yeah. I like how Ravi chose a non-standard unit like a paper clip because he knows this marker or a pen isn't very big. So you chose a paper clip that would be small. I am here with Larissa Weeks, who is a second grade teacher, and she had a few thoughts to share about Reveal Math. So my class has really been enjoying Reveal Math this year. Um, Mr. Ferdet just got to watch us do our Be Curious. I've noticed that my students love this part. They're so engaged. They're all raising their hands. They want to share. I've noticed um, since the beginning of the year that their conversations have become more advanced. You know, in the early months they were sharing about colors and things like that. We're really having these deep math conversations. I'm always so impressed with the things they're coming up with. I'm even noticing some students who might not normally share are participating it's really engaging for them. One of my favorite parts of it is when someone will hit on something that's going to be in the lesson that day. They just impress me and it's one of my favorite parts of Reveal. All right, and now for our Be Curious. All right, so our Be Curious today says, is it always true? Any whole number can be represented with a fraction. So I want you to show me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a thumbs in the middle if you're unsure. So I want everyone to either put their thumbs up, thumbs in the middle, or thumbs down. 
Can any whole number be represented with a fraction? So I'm thinking in my head, what is a whole number? What is a fraction? Can that be written as a fraction? And I'm going to call on some volunteers to share your thinking. What are you thinking, Violet? to be even. Okay, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Patrick? Okay, any whole number, it just has to be split into equal parts. I love that you're thinking um, about our previous lessons. Eli? Any fraction can be a whole number if the numerator and denominator are the same. Awesome, I see some of your designs. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? So we're thinking of a whole number, any whole number. So any whole number could be the number two or the number 1002. Can both of those numbers be written as a fraction? Yes. Awesome, and that kind of ties into our lesson Day. So what Eli mentioned was our lesson from yesterday or from last week um, where we talked about how the, when the numerator and denominator are the same, like this, so if we have four fourths, that equals one whole. But what about when you have four holes? So you have I'm here with Miss Malcolm, who uh, you just observed in a third grade classroom. Uh, Courtney, can you tell us a little bit about, um, we saw in your um, lesson, we saw the end of a um, number routine and also then a Be Curious routine. Can you talk about how those have progressed over the year with your students? Absolutely. So when we first started, especially with the Be Curious, um, I've noticed that the responses would be a little bit more like superficial, like they would notice the color or just how many of the objects there would be. Um, but as we've progressed, I've noticed that they're applying like previous mathematical skills that we've learned that they haven't seen before and they're starting to tie it into what the lesson might be. So they're starting to think of um, just the different mathematical practices that we use. So they're, they're using a lot of like um, the critical thinking skills that we want them to see in third grade at this point. And how would you say that differs a little bit from our previous program? You did teach with the math expressions. The math expressions, I would say, didn't um, offer a lot of time in the curriculum or the pacing for us to kind of have these questions and have these conversations with the students. And I've noticed especially the students that tend to struggle with math are the ones that will raise their hand for the Be Curious. So it's really nice to hear um, their higher level of thinking because they're not ones that will typically raise their hand often in a typical math lesson. And three ways. We should hit hit 12. Yep, you guys have some great ideas. Great number. <coughs> great number ideas. Awesome. Okay. Mathematicians. I am going to have you go now and turn and learn. It's going to go off any second, I bet. You're going to turn and learn. This is not a real alarm. This is a timer. A Sounds like an alarm, though. To your math partner and share with each other. Show each other your different, the different ways that you speak and decompose this problem. That's good. Okay, let's go. Two minutes. Decompose seven tenths. Wow, is 
she correct? Yes. yes. Did anyone solve it differently and would like to come up to the board? What are, we're just going to take a minute. We're just going to look about it, at it, and we're going to think about it. Replay it one more time. So let's think about this. <coughs> think about math and how it can relate to this these various tasks. Oh, I like how I can see Abby's thinking already. Hmm. Okay, that was a minute. These are this is what I want you to think about, okay? How would you describe each pattern block in the representation? How would you describe each pattern block in this representation? And do you notice any relationships? Okay? So how are how are they the same? How are they different? Two minutes, share with your partner. One unit. So if we suppose that the value of the hexagon is one unit, the value of the other shapes, um, their size, we're gonna think about their size compared to this hexagon, compared to the one unit. So how about everybody takes out a red trapezoid? Take out your red trapezoid. And I want you to place the red trapezoid on top of your yellow hexagon, and I want you to think about what fraction that represents. And you can raise your hand instead of calling out, raise your hand when you have the answer. Pedro. Okay, so the red trapezoid is worth one half of a unit. Now let's do the same thing with the blue rhombus. Put it on top of the yellow hexagon. You can take the red trapezoid off. <coughs> nope, that's not what I'm asking, my friend. Put it on, right on top of your, right on top, buddy. There you go. Right on top of the yellow hexagon. What fraction does that represent, Corey? Okay, so the blue rhombus represents one third of a unit. And then the last one you're gonna get everybody is the green triangle. triangle, you got it. Throw it on top of the hexagon. What fraction does this green But remember, are all of those shapes <laughs> worth one whole, or are some of them less than one? So that's one they all have different one and two sets. So, all right, thank you, Miss Jackson. So if you could just share a little bit about what you've noticed about the reveal math here in fourth grade. Yeah, I today we worked on the ignite um, for unit ten. And I just feel that the Ignite does a really nice job introducing the concepts 
of the lessons that follow. And in particular, something like this does a really nice job um, of marrying the strategy with the use of mani manipulatives so that all my students, regardless of their skill level in math, get some really nice hands-on experience. Great, thank you. She said if we break apart two and three, then if we put them back together, it will make five. Okay, anything else that anybody notices about this or wonders about this picture? What do you notice, ma'am? Um, if you take away um, four and you break apart the one off it, then if you combine them together, then it would equal five. Yes, yes, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Um, they're, they're breaking apart numbers, there's space between everything. <coughs> And it's, so when you break it up, it's easy to tell that they're they're broken up because there's the space between it. And when you have when you have it breaking up, they're in different columns, and then one, and then when you put it back together, it equals ten because you take them apart. Okay. Yep. This picture has five, but yeah, we did ten just a few minutes ago. Um. So we really want to thank our teachers. <clears throat> a couple of highlights before you go back to your part and when we ask you all the things you observed um, is uh, these aren't, we're not unveiling here a dog and pony show. We really threw it out and just said, we're going to be coming through and, and videoing. We didn't say we're coming in at this time. I want to see this, make it look good. Um, and that's, we really wanted it to, to feel genuine because it is, this is what we do see on a daily basis when we go through classrooms. Um, so I did want to highlight that. One other thing I wanted to highlight too and, and around the engagement part, you noticed a lot of this platform is very different than what we had, right? This platform is certainly very um, online based. And one of the things that I know teachers really appreciate, they do have all these routines, but teachers can really have some, um, you know, kind of some say in how they present that. It allows you all these lessons come in a slide deck so that you can actually move these different portions of the lesson. Some people say, I want to do that Ignite first. Some people like to start with the Be Curious, but they can kind of, um, from lesson to lesson, and even you know from classroom to classroom, um, customize that a bit. And I think that's been a, re a real strength of it too. They do like having that kind of customization of it. Um, that's anything you wanted to add on kind of your thoughts? No, I think, yeah, no, I think that, that, that um, we tried to encapsulate through dif different ages, as you saw, we ended with kindergarten, sort of those youngest math minds. Um, uh, sort of what we see throughout the, the weeks. And um, it, this is uh, replicated in other, you know, all of our other elementary schools with the, this real math, K to five, which is great. Yeah. Can I just make a comment that um, I learned about 30% of the things that I didn't know? So, those kids, not to say that a fourth grade is smarter than me, but I definitely learned a bunch of stuff <laughs> in that section. So, very good. Very different than we learned math. No, it's definitely kids. different than we learned math, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But the concrete. I would have been a fourth grade math teacher. That's what I think I'm saying. <laughs> Not going higher than that. <laughs> just as we as we look back, we wanted you and, and just teasing, unless you have, do want to comment on this. Just some of the things when you go back um, and uh, look at the math dialogue. Hopefully, you saw some rich dialogue and heard teachers talk about how that's progressed throughout the year. Very true, right? You hear these. I'm noticing and and, and using kind of math terminology. Um, the commonalities between the grades, you saw those be curious in different grade levels. You know, certainly much more. You hear fourth and you're like, wow, am I, what am I thinking here? You're right. I do have to pay attention. But even our kindergartners talking about breaking apart and decomposing numbers like they were doing that in the other grades. Um, and then the engagement. I think we found this, prog this program to be en engaging. Hopefully you could see that in the kind of different presentations that were, different styles. Um, there are certainly mass stations and things that are also a part of this. Um, there are also online <clears throat> pieces where we can do our assessments online to this as well, but also can still use um, traditional paper and pencil tasks too. So um, it really is, I think, you know, we're, we're doing the hard work of inventing in year one, but we've been very pleased and I think we're going to hopefully reap some real benefits as this progresses along our strategic plan. It looks great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And certainly any questions we can take if anyone has any. Any questions or comments? I was, I was just going to ask. It, it seems like the teachers were very enthusiastic. And students, any feedback from the parents? I mean, they're the ones that at home, you know, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I mean, the other way, and I was, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it 
you know, I think they've at least been indoctrinated to that for a little bit, right? The, that <laughs> real math switch, we've been doing that for years. Our, our uh, past program dentist said the same thing. But I think they, it's going to take a while for them to kind of feel that difference. There, there are some distinct differences. I think when teachers... Um, and we used Math Expressions for quite some time because we had a um, second iteration of it with Common Core. Um, I think as they get more confident and comfortable too, you know, kids will hear more about it. But I think they do, you know, the routines are great. And hopefully some of these discussions come out around, um, you know, when we're talking about math and kind of looking through that kind of math lens throughout the world. I know, you know, my daughters are hated when I come home because I'll ask something very specific and I don't get an answer because I'm just curious how things are going uh, when you... You know, in the same grade levels that you kind of are part of, but um, it, it'll be interesting. I think when we after year one, I, I could see certainly some um, pieces for us in, in, in sharing that more with the par the parent and the family community because I think uh, teachers always want to feel comfortable to be experts on it. And it takes that year of implementation to feel that way. But thank you. Though. Anybody else? I I think that this kind of program is very important going forward because the way it's People are talking, the students are learning to talk about math. And I think in the old way, it was more you do it in your, your head and you show the result on the paper. And now it's, okay, let's talk about it. It's really important to do that because that's how we're going to use math and are using math now every single day um, more and more. And if you can talk about something, usually you understood it. So moving forward, so la I think it was last meeting or the meeting before, I talked about um, one of the teachers at the middle school who is having a parent group that uh, joins the, uh, her every month or every couple of weeks, and they're learning the math themselves now so they can help their student. Um, has there been anything like that asked by parents to do anything at the elementary level? Uh, we have, I, I don't know um, specifically about all the elementary level, but I haven't had any specific requests around that. Um, you know, it's something certainly we'd love to, sh we'd love to share with, um, with folks from um, home and in the community. But that as far as them um, learning, I, we have, a, as I, I tease Dr. Bay Renovan, but he really is an expert on um, translating elementary math to, to parent. He has a published book about it, even, that it is something that is, um, we, we, we came from the very concrete when we learn things and learn things um, a certain way and that's how you did it and that's why we struggle with our children and their homework um, at home. But I do think, and it's hard for some kids, some kids do want to do it one way and the right way and it does not allow that. It, allow, it, it exposes you to multiple ways to do that but they can choose the one that works best for them too. So but that's hard for some kids. They just wanna say, well, I, I, I know the answer to this or you're making me do this. And it's about the kind of conceptualization of all that kind of all those skills. But yeah, it is. I think it. I think it opens up as we think down our, our strategic plan as well. Like part of this math, I think sharing kind of this because I, it, you know, I think we 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 have pilot teachers do this. They feel good about it. But then there's certainly always some trepidation around implementing something brand new. And I think when we like, I'm feeling just kind of these conversations we've had with staff beginning of the year to that they're comfort level with now, and then they do it year two all over again and, and can really kind of. Um, tighten procedures and kind of explore pieces of it. Um, I think down the road, you know, sharing this with the, you know, the community is certainly a great, and what I'm hearing is certainly a, something that we'd love to do. And is the response back from staff that they basically have enough professional development at this point, or? So we've, uh, for um, the way it's broken down, we've really done all of our kind of um, building base uh, uh, stuff has been around in the area of um, DEI, social emotional learning, um, and all of our um, department days for elementary has been math. So we've, we've invested quite a bit in this, and then that's going to be layered in next year as well. We have math time as well, and I know we've embedded a lot. We have um, our math coach come by and meet with teams separately too. And almost when you're doing this, they don't know what to ask yet. Right, you kind of like they're unit to unit, and they're learning that unit for the first time. And as they kind of get that scope and sequence of it and figure it out, I think we're really, you know, going to be able to have um, even some more kind of pointed PD next year, where we've kind of had people. Um, and it was almost in a two-track thing where we had pilot teachers and then kind of an expert group join and do a bit more, and we had somebody on each team join that, so they became um, a little bit more of a. Um, kind of a consumer of this and have really hopefully been, um, you know, lightning rods for the people in their team so that then they had kind of the other basic level. So it's been thoughtful 
the rollout of the PD, but it does continue into next year. And we know it doesn't mean that ends going. Um, new programs do need. Thanks, Susan. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to comment that I'm really glad to see the resources that this has for teachers. I mean, I happen to have taught on the math expression. The math expressions did deal with the strategies and the decomposing numbers and all of those things that were part of the um, Common Core. But if you wanted to add any of these conversational things, teachers had to create those pieces themselves. It wasn't that you couldn't do that with a lesson, but it's really nice to see that it's just made things much easier for teachers to do it on a regular basis it's really part of the program, so I think that's only going to help. Right. Dennis, did you have anything? Oh, well, you scared me so much with the look for us that I actually took notes. Let me hear it. You guys are so. No, I really thought it was. Um, I thought it was terrific. Um, I really thought um, the teachers did a really nice job. Yeah, me too. Um, you know, connecting uh, the current lesson to prior lessons. Um, I really liked uh, what one teacher did. Um, around um, having the kids thumbs up, you know, thumbs in the middle or thumbs down. Um, because I think it's great to have kids participate. Some kids can't participate. This is another great way to involve them. And it made me think of um, the uh, embrace failure, almost as embrace uncertainty, that it's okay for you mm -hmm. not to know. It's okay to say that. Um, and, I, and so I really like that. Um, I, I like that aspect of her teaching technique as well. Um, I like the manipulatives and how the colors on the, I don't know if you noticed this, but the colors on the clear touch match the manipulatives. So I thought that was terrific mm -hmm. in terms of helping kids to gain a level of comfort as they're learning these new concepts, maybe by identifying the colors first, but then having the concepts, you know, um, evolve, you know, as they're going through all of these things. Um, it was really just a, ter a terrific job by our staff. So thank you very much. Um, I do have one question. Um, so I'm wondering, like, if you have... Um, maybe special education students in the classroom. So I, you know, I love a multimodal approach, right? I mean, I think this really, you know, is terrific in terms of meeting uh, the needs of a lot of different types of learners. Um, but how are they doing? Are they able to keep up? You know, because there is a certain amount of independence <coughs> that kids have to have in the turn and talk or, you know, when they're working independently. How is that going? Uh, I mean, I, in my, my opinion, I think, um, and one of our teachers talked about this, the, the way these lessons are set up, there's a lot of entry points for kids, okay. I think. Right. So what, where some student might not have a total grasp of this, um, there are certainly observations they can make. Right. And, and I think we know when, um, wh when some of our support services are best made, it's not just totally a, a separate program that we're doing, right? Okay. Some of these kids might need to um, have some more specialized instruction around some of these um, specific skills but that we want them always exposed to this core curriculum that's really important for them to hear all this language and to hear those routines and to see that. So, um, you know, it's not something where we're pulling uh, many kids out of this. You know, okay. they might have some time out of it when there's maybe some independent work that's a little bit more supported, but that they, um, it's important they are part of these, these major routines, no, these yeah. ignite. And the be curious is building their self-esteem and right. their, their math confidence when maybe that wouldn't have been the case a few years ago if they were in this, with a different curriculum. Right. Yeah. And there's really no right answer to it be curious or to an ignite mm -hmm. that's you know and if you, you look back at the presentation one of the things with the ignite is just interacting with materials just to play right there might be right. some things and there's time just to explore that right. and that's very meaningful at all different kind of points of um understanding great thank you very much yeah no i uh, thank you I, I the one thing i want to point out i really appreciated was uh, particularly as the kids got older a lot of the collaborative work that they were doing in groups i think um obviously just to get those um, skills kind of back and interacting with peers is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, as a side note, I did appreciate how you tied this work also to the strategic plan. Yeah, I did. I noticed oh, I that. I picked right up on it. Right <laughs> and Tess is very excited about it, too, because it all, it all weaves together. But, uh, no, Betsy and uh, Jason, thank you very much for coming tonight. Yeah, thank I thought you, it was man. a great uh, presentation. Thank so you. thank you for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> And we're now going to transition to our second presentation of this evening. Um, and this is something that we had said we would um, do with the onset of the school year. Um, we were going to have a little bit of a different presentation philosophy this year where um, each of the five priority areas of the strategic plan we're going to present at a meeting to kind of really talk about and highlight some of the work that's taking place. And then we said we would do a mid-year check-in, which is now. And then over the course of the summer, we'll do a um, good night. We'll do a uh, another check-in uh, to report out our findings uh, for the year.
So um, Tess Nicholson Powers is with uh, District Management Group. Uh, Tess has been uh, with us actually for three years during the be uh, beginning rollout of the strategic plan. Has stayed on with us to do a lot of the work with the uh, special ed opportunities review, and now even um, kind of the implementation of some of that work. So, um, thank you for coming, Tess. I will turn it over to you, and I uh, look forward to um, hearing and um, talking a little bit about the uh, the implementation of the strategic plan. Great. It's good to see so many of you in person. Uh, and that was, oh, Jason already left, but I, I studied math in college and was an elementary uh, school teacher. So this was the right meeting for me to come to. And I wish that I had taught math like that back then. Um, but anyway, so yes, I'll be talking about the strategic plan. And I just want to say, you know, you see it up there pretty, but really the strategic plan is living in the buildings every single day. And that's what we just saw at Biom. Uh, Jason talked about that math priority and why this new curriculum was implemented. So I'll give this summary, but just wanted to say this is certainly living in the district. Um, I did add just a couple slides on the process. Wanted to first just uh, thank all of the people who have been involved in not only the creation of the strategic plan, but implementation from school committee members, district leaders, school leaders, and others, all assigned to a specific area. Uh, and how we've worked this year, there's been two phases. So we used the fall really to take a look at the data from last year. So where were goals met? Uh, where were goals not met? What initiatives do we need to implement to ensure we meet those goals? Uh, to refine, refine those specific action steps. And then since October have been tracking progress on those initiatives. I know you've heard from each of the subcommittees in a bit more detail, um, but just making tremendous progress uh, overall. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how we work throughout the year, so every six weeks uh, the steering committee that you saw comes together uh, and we work with uh, that group to progress monitor, holds everyone accountable, uh, that every six weeks we come together, talk about the work that has been done in between with those subcommittees at the bottom uh, aligned to each of the priority areas. Areas. So this very intentional working structure makes sure that the strategic plan does not only live within the school committee or district leaders, but is really funneling down to the schools, leaders, and staff who are part of those groups as well. Uh, and I didn't record one of our uh, progress monitoring meetings like uh, Jason showed you in Biome, but did just want to give a little overview of how we spend that time. Uh, in those uh, every six week meetings, we have a very specific discussion protocol to make sure that everyone can understand uh, progress towards initiatives across the priorities. Uh, other groups have a chance to ask clarifying questions or get feedback, problem solve on anything they need to. Uh, and then we wrap up and talk about what next steps need to happen in the six weeks to make sure we stay on track. Uh, so this has just been uh, an incredible way to ensure that the strategic plan, five-year plan uh, action is happening every day and checking in every six weeks. Uh, so wanted to add that just as the process, but getting now more into the content. So this is the framework that Chelmsford used to develop the strategic plan. So you have your mission, vision, theory of action, priorities, and goals. Where we are right now really is in this implementation phase, making it come to life. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to call out is just through the strategic planning process, of course, has set the priorities and really has started to lead budget choices like adopting reveal math or investing in the math specialists and interventionists, uh, which is exactly what we'd hope to see is uh, those investments aligned to strategy. So I think Chelmsford has just done a great job, again, making that strategic plan come to life in the many ways a district operates. Uh, so just grounding, you all know this, uh, in the mission and vision that was adopted. I'm not going to read it to you, uh, but that really is where the strategic plans, plan stems from. 
Uh, you have your theory of action, which is really grounded in district leader direction, making sure principals can create conditions and culture in their schools. I think we saw that uh, in Viam today. And that teachers foster an inclusive learning environment. And so that is what we also saw in those math classrooms. Uh, and so just wanted to highlight kind of just all the different key stakeholders in the district uh, who are really giving their all to make sure the vision of Chelmsford Public Schools comes to life. So I am going to, oh, Linda. I'm going to show the You're top gonna... and bottom of the slides. To, there oh, we go. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to go into a little, <laughs> a little more detail into each of the priority areas now. Uh, so starting with academic achievement. Great. Uh, so I know you have this. There's a lot here. But just to ground us, so we have the metrics at the top there. Those are the measurable goals that were set aligned to the priority areas. And then the short list of initiatives uh, that the team is working on aligned to that priority. Uh, we know that if we try and do everything well, we'll do nothing well. And so you'll see this throughout the priorities, the short list uh, of initiatives this year. So just want to call out, and we showed this in the summer, uh, in the academic area, hit on third grade, both goals surpassed. Uh, really, you can see the focus there is eighth grade math, and that's why we've been talking about those math investments. Uh, but all initiatives on track uh, to implement the new curriculum, work on iReady, and just make sure that students have what they need to be successful, especially in math, as we've talked about. Uh, in terms of the equity group, so this is really focused on supporting students with IEPs uh, as well as students from low-income backgrounds. Uh, you can see here they met a lot of their goals and actually surpassed quite significantly some of them. So we had to revisit some of the 2024 targets to make sure that, uh, and still are, to make sure that the target is not lower than where they actually ended up in 2023, uh, but also some targets that were not met. And so this has allowed the team to really focus on those areas. Uh, and I always say if, if everything were green, we probably weren't aggressive enough. Uh, so very understandable to see this uh, and excited to see the results at the end of the school year. Uh, as uh, we mentioned, have done a lot of work this year to implement some of the findings from the special education opportunity review, specifically related to that first initiative around clarifying the role of paraprofessionals. Uh, so I'll give a more uh, in detail update at the end of the year when we wrap up that work. But we've been working actually in this room uh, with a group of from superintendent to school leaders to paraprofessionals teachers really diving into that role to make sure uh, that they are supported uh, and that students are getting the support that they need. Uh, going on to, oh, we missed one. Oh, social emotional learning. Uh, so you heard that uh, Jason talk about this as well, even embedded into the math curriculum, which is great. Uh, last year was all about laying the foundation of implementing Panorama, getting that baseline data. Uh, so you can see those top two metrics are really the focus this year, trying to increase those percentages around students feeling a sense of belonging. Uh, those bottom two around uh, students feeling they have supportive relationships just saw great baseline data. So the team chose to maintain, is aiming to maintain those scores for this year while focusing on that sense of belonging through the below initiatives, uh, through DEI practices, PD, uh, and really thinking about those transition years to make sure as students go from school to school, uh, they are supported and still feel that sense of belonging, but very on track here. 
Uh, and then going on to human capital, last year was also a year of gathering a lot of baseline data. Uh, so if I draw your attention to that 2023 actual, uh, you can see baseline data uh, from teachers and staff. Uh, similar to SEL, the group chose to really focus on increasing that percent uh, of it, both of those top metrics, uh, those who feel adequately prepared to differentiate for diverse student populations and feel equipped to provide culturally responsive instruction. Uh, and so that PD around DEI has been really critical towards those metrics, and that is where uh, we're hoping to see that increase this year. Uh, the team has also been doing a lot of work by going to fairs to try to diversify the applicant pool. Uh, of course, kind of a positive and drawback is that your teachers like to stay, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but just will take time as positions open up to diversify that pool. Uh, and then lastly, operations and facilities. Uh, so superintendent has been part of this subcommittee leading that uh, and really just making sure that uh, the money is being spent on what it should be. Uh, right now, just one metric and initiative that is somewhat on hold is the maintenance work orders. I know there's been uh, some bumps in the road there, but uh, have really been focused both on those short-term capital plans uh, and review of the building conditions. Uh, and so a lot of work has been done there. Um, so happy to answer more specifically on any of those initiatives, but I know you already got uh, the very detailed updates from the teams. One thing that I just wanted to note, and Jason did this at the beginning of this meeting, but the steering committee has been talking a lot about communication and just how do we ensure that all staff, families, et cetera, uh, really see the strategic plan living since it is every day making that connection. Uh, and so the team has been brainstorming about just making sure in communications to families and newsletters that connection to the strategic plan is made, uh, implementing a consistent structure so that school leaders, as they do PD, they're making the connection to the strategic strategic plan, even just with one slide, um, as Jason did earlier, because uh, it really is living, uh, living in the buildings every day. So I want to make sure we're making that direct connection so everyone feels a part of this plan. Um, so that is all from me, but happy to answer any questions at this mid-year point. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? Dennis? I, I guess it would probably be more directed towards Jay and to Thunder. When, when we see these like the, the outcomes that are read, um, where we set a goal of, let's we'll say, eighth grade math, 64% is 55%. Mm -hmm. Are we then digging down to find out what's going on? And because then we set our goal at 65% again. You know, so we went down a little bit. What are we doing in response to those type of things? <laughs> um, so, yes, we did notice that. So when we took a look at that group of students, they had um, – Year over year, that whole cohort, cohort, cohort I can't even talk cohort. today. Cohort, thank you, of students um, were performing lower than any of their peers. So they actually did make progress, but they didn't make progress up against what we had put for a target. So we are anticipating this group of eighth graders to outperform the students, and we're giving supports to those students who are now in ninth grade at the high school. My follow-up, what are we doing then? If we know that the cohort is lagging, what are we doing Correct. extra so for that? That was indicative of a lot of the COVID years and that gap that starts to widen as students start to go into sixth grade math and then they start to branch off in seventh and eighth grade with the honors. We ended up giving them more supports and identifying specific lessons at the high school level so that those students could be supported when they're at Chelmsford High School. Do we see anything in the in the seventh grade, sixth grade, fifth grade? Do we see that? Is it? It, it ebbs and flows, right? Okay. So it's it, it's a matter of um, looking at, well, right now we've combined the schools too, so it's a little more difficult for us to dig into it because some of them may have been at one school or another school. So we're going to have to look at some of those outlying uh, factors as we look at this next group coming in. But we tend to be performing consistently. So if you were to take that current ninth grade class who were 
taking that MCAS and through iReady when they were eighth graders, and you followed them through, they were making progress, but they had already started at a lower threshold. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, I have kind of a more general comment and then something more specific. First, I'm, so I'm part of the group that meets with the Zoom, with the DM group, and the plans every six weeks. And I did mention at our last meeting, I was a school committee member, I really find this model to be super helpful to me, that we have some really specific measurable goals to look at so it can kind of help with our um, thinking as we're envisioning the future at Chelmsford Schools and the budget and all. One of the slides there was how strategic planning leads to district priorities, which then helps us with budget choices. So being this informed and this focused, I think, has been really helpful. So it brings me to my next issue, which I brought up before, and I'm going to keep bringing it up because I think it's really important. Um, one of the things we just approved in the new fiscal year 2025 budget is some new special ed teachers, specifically at the elementary level. And I want to keep tying it back to, you know, the reason we need more is to help with this equity goal of increasing the percentage of students who are proficient or above in math and ELA. And I, I, care, I made a copy of this, that special ed opportunity review, because I think the things in this are so important. So that I, I just wanted to speak up once again that I really am looking forward to hearing what the outcome of the equity group is in defining and clarifying the roles and responsibilities of paraprofessionals. Because we hear in the meetings that they're having meetings and that they say they're on target, but we haven't yet really heard what changes might come about because of that. And I think we have to be forward, looking forward to maybe the next year or the year after strategic plan goals have to be aligned with that, the best practice of, as it said, I'll take it directly from it, academic support is best provided by content area experts with content area training. So we need to hear what's going on with the powers, but then look forward to how does that then go into who's going to provide that content and instruction. So I just want to keep our eyes focused on that piece of it as well. Yeah. I just want to follow up on what Susan was saying. She said it much more articulately than I will. Um, so over the course of the year, you know, we've had the updates and now we're seeing this mid-year review. And it is, it's hard for, you know, me to pull all the pieces mm -hmm. together. So I was looking at the initiatives and I was wondering if there could be something included in there around what action steps have been taken. Because I don't know. Um, so I'll you know, give you an example. Um, it says that we're going to continue to implement a district data dashboard panorama uh, to improve database decision making. Like, who's doing that? Mm -hmm. you know, how is it being done? And then are there parameters you know, uh, that we've set you know, that are con you know, of concern that are going to kickstart a process for action or some type of intervention? And what are those? Mm -hmm. you know, so I, those kinds of things, I think, you know, it would be um, helpful to me to kind of round out my understanding of what's happening in the subcommittees and what um, action steps are being taken and how those action steps are moving us closer to being able to meet our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and e so each initiative does have its own action plan with more of those detailed steps, timeline, and then we rate, you know, you saw the initiatives overall on track, off track. Right. Et cetera, but each action step within that has on track, off track, et cetera. And that's what we review every six weeks in the meeting. Um, so, Jay and Linda, you know, I think we can share those, especially if there are specific ones yeah. uh, that you're curious about. But all those more specific actions do exist. Yeah, I just think it'll help, um, at least for me, um, my understanding of, you know, you know, what's happening in these committees and what, mm -hmm. what the process is. Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, this is an excellent report, but it's, it uh, it leaves me with a lot of questions that I think you're right could probably be answered through those other mm -hmm. reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to kind of find the the balance of presenting like the higher level, right? Um, right. What's been happening with the district, but when you do get into the individual um, of the five areas, there is a specific plan into each one and different action items and steps. Right. We can certainly share those with you. Sure. I think on a um, like a public level, we're trying to come up with some ways to to educate um, you know parents and community members and others that could be watching. Again, high level, what's happening with the check ins? I do. I have gotten good feedback about the committee meetings where we've had each of the priority priority areas report out. So that kind of is more the in depth. Um, I do think the kind of this um, global review twice a year is going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, those are the documents that they exist. There are working documents. We certainly can share them if you want to get a little deeper. 
um, a lot of that work is really the, the focus of the work with the subcommittees when they act together. Um, so you do, it's finding that happy medium between what is going to be good for everyone. Um, we did have a, a talk, as Tess had mentioned at the last meeting, about um, really operationalizing the strategic plan and trying to be very deliberate in um, talking about our actions and how they actually tie to the plan itself. And like Sue, you mentioned with the budget. But we look at like the two big areas that we actually um, added some funding for some positions this year were around the math specialists, particularly at the elementary grade level, and again, special education to help with that equity achievement gap of our special ed students um, growing higher than we'd like it to be compared to our general ed students. So we really are having our dollars and our budgets align with this uh, plan. And then ultimately, in the end, we want to assess. We want to see where we are. Were our targets too great? Were they too low? Were they uh, pushing us enough? Um, so that certainly is happening, but we can um, certainly share those other documents with you. And if you want to, if people want to get deep into them, they can. And if they want the surface level or the higher level, they certainly have those as well. Maria or John, did you? Have um, well, I've been part of this whole process from the beginning, um, and I think I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the subcommittees and you sit at the subcommittee level, then we go through all of those things. That's why, and I've come to the to the conclusion that, in many ways, I have to trust what's going on at each one of mm -hmm. the um, subcommittee levels because uh, they're doing it at the pace that they believe is going to work well within the system. Uh, for example, what you brought up, Susan, understood. Um, that is part of the equity um, part of things. And it, for me personally, I would have wanted it done six to months ago, um, but I understand why they're doing it the way that they are, um, because there are several things happening within the system that it has to be at this particular pace. I can see why. Um, whether we should talk about every single one of those things at this level, probably not okay. Um, but I think that in the end, you're going to see that there will be results. And, it's important to keep on mentioning those. And part of the equity thing, too, is not just about the disparity with what's happening between um, special ed and how they're doing and the other students in, in the system. It's also about you know equalizing in terms of students who uh, economically may need some assistance as well. And identifying that group is difficult. Uh, tracking their needs is very difficult. So this is something that, you know, we've been discussing how to do it and so on um, and without hurting anybody in the process and actually helping them instead. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that being because it brings different people from different parts of the system into the subcommittee, it actually helps everybody to see different reasons why you might not want to do something at a particular time or why you might want to change something in a particular way because we bring in those different perspectives. And I've noticed that quite a bit in the equity one uh, because quite a few of the members are part of the special ed team uh, versus, you know, so, and I bring in the community perspective and so on. So it's, it's actually good that those subcommittees exist because it's just not one point of view, it's many that come to making the decision and when things will be implemented. And for me, it's just as hard because I wish very much that things are a lot slower than I want them to be because I'd like all these children to just automatically be able to grasp all this immediately. Um, but there is some improvement going on. It's just gonna take time to measure it. So I think it is fair to say that, you know, there is, you know, you're right, trying to find that right way to um, share this message, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think if the information is available to committee members who want to do a little bit deeper dive into what's happening on each committee, that would be very helpful. Great. Can I ask one more content thing? You mentioned there's a bump in the road with the work order. What, what's the bump? Yeah, it's not a particular, uh, it's not a particular bump. We, we have a work order system that we use to track with um, DPW, any repairs that we need. So uh, we've had that in place for quite some time, and we can produce reports out of the system now that actually um, show like what's getting done and what's not getting done. One of the things that we're trying to do is get a little bit deeper in the system to actually categorize like some of the requests for repairs and set up like 
you know, what would the expectation be if, let's say, a um, you know, if a door is on, if a door won't lock properly, right? That's like a top priority needs to be completed within 24 hours. Let's say if, if someone reports a um, um, a leaky faucet in a bathroom or something like that. That might be like a medium term fix that has to be done between like one and three days. Like we're trying to kind of just drill down and work with DPW to come up with some expectations on that because it all ties back to the reporting uh, functionality. Right now the reporting piece of the system is paper. Um, so we're trying to move to more of like an electronic reporting because what's happening now is um, I can produce a report right now that would show us even over the last week like what got done. Um, but when the tradespeople come in during the morning, they might pick up four or five slips of things to do for that day, and they go out and do the work, and they note it down, and they bring the paper back to the office. And then right now, when someone has time, they go in and they close out the ticket. But if I run the report, and let's say someone you know did get done today, but it was a bad week paperwork-wise, so the paperwork didn't get entered until a week from now, it would actually look like it took a lot longer for something to be repaired because the entry date on the ticket is bad. And I don't want to put a report out there that's going to show, um, you know, we put in a ticket and it took, you know, two months to get something done. When it actually probably got done a lot quicker. So we've been having conversations about trying to actually digitize the um, the work process even for the, the laborers so that they would actually just record their, their pieces on a tablet so they would have like an iPad or something. And when they're done, they would just instantaneously close the ticket themselves so it's happening in real time. And that way our reporting would be better. So the work is actually happening. That's That's not the problem. We're just trying to figure out a, a better metrics for the reporting so that what we actually put out there is more accurately displayed uh, when things are getting done. And again, agreeing to like those timelines around urgency and things like that. So that's the only little uh, glitch we've had. And the only the, the tie-up has really just been time because um, we were coming out of the, all the capital projects from the summer. We've got to get the people together who are actually doing the projects. So we just had a lot of work going on. Then we kind of, with DPW also, you're switching into the snow season, which didn't really happen. Um, and then, you know, we're getting into capital planning and things like that. But it's really just been more of a time thing. Um, so we are on track to, to kind of have that and be able to produce our first set of reports from the system that hopefully will then build upon to try to make them better. Um, but that just took a little bit more time than we thought. And DPW is on board with trying to... Yeah, we're all trying to do this, and, and everyone's been very cooperative. It's just kind of agreeing to that and then uh, running with it. So, uh, and again, I could produce the report. It just wouldn't be really timely with regard to, like, when something got done because of the, the paper process as opposed to trying to digitize. As long as the work's getting done. The work's getting okay. done, yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Anybody else? Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, can I say something yes. to yes. test? I just... Uh, I think... The work with your group has been really, really good, Tess. And mm -hmm. just in terms of timing, um, just you've had a, an actual opportunity while all this has been going on to create a totally new human being <laughs> to come into this world. <laughs> Tess became a mother throughout this entire process. Oh, congratulations. Amazing, right? Thank you. So I just honestly, <laughs> everything takes its time. It honestly does. Um, and, and I know that committee work, you know, just can take quite a bit, but it is being thoughtfully done, which I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah one thing I was going to say, this is a five-year plan, and we're about a little more than a year and a half in, uh, and change is hard, and uh, districts are complex organizations with a lot of stakeholders, and so I think it's important for any, you know, big initiative or change that's going to happen. One for the paras, for example, you know, having that cross-functional group, testing ideas, having paras be part of the change instead of just saying, oh, here's the change we're going to make and have changed done to them, uh, I think it's just going to be so valuable in what you can then actually see in schools and classrooms. Uh, that's what I've seen most effective just in my work with other districts. Great. Well, congratulations, first of all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you very much for coming in. Yes, thank you all. Thank Thanks, Tess. Thanks, Thanks very much thank for you. the update. No. Uh, next item up on the evening agenda is the uh, vote on the school choice program for the 20, uh, the next year, 24, uh, 25. So just as way of uh, background, our district for a number of years has participated in uh, the school choice program, which uh, basically we identify a number of seats of the district where we have um, some capacity and some space, primarily at the high school level. And uh, we offer up those seats to any people in neighboring communities that might be interested in attending uh, Chelmsford Public Schools. 
Um, for us as a district, uh, again, if we have capacity, um, we're able to bring in some additional students. The state uh, basically provides $5,000 of funding per student through uh, the Chapter 70 program. Uh, funding would come through us um, as a calculation. So the district that is sending the child basically is not receiving 5,000 and we are. And uh, they're um, acclimated and, and treated like a, any other Chelmsford High School or, or Chelmsford Public School student. So it's worked really well for us. Um, this current year, we have 37 students um, in the program. We typically try to have about 40 students overall in the program. Sometimes people will um, withdraw. Uh, they Like our own students, they, their family might move to a different community and it's just too far away. So it does happen. But we usually try to have the year starting out with uh, 40 slots. So of the 37 that we have for the current year, six of them are high school seniors who will be graduating in June and then obviously moving on, which leaves us with uh, 31 students returning the next year because you always come back. So when you're in once, you're in uh, permanently. So I uh, provided you the grade level distribution of those um, students. And again, primarily because we have the capacity at the, um, the high school level, my recommendation is to bring that number back up to uh, 40 students for next year and doing so by um, adding eight additional um, spots for incoming ninth grade students at um, Chelmsford High School and adding uh, one spot for an additional incoming fifth grade student at um, Parker Middle School. Um, so those 31 adding up those nine would be 40. Um, and when we take a look at the high school numbers, we're going to currently have two ninth graders next year already. So adding those eight uh, brings up to 10. So we have 10, we have 11 and 10, 11 and, um, I'm sorry, 11 and 10th, 11 and 11th um, grade, and then obviously a smaller uh, senior class. But that's also um, easy enough for the high school to be able to schedule. It's not like you have 40 freshmen or, or you know, or a lot of uh, seniors there. It's a good spread. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Again, this is a, a program that we participated in uh, prior to me even coming here, and uh, we've received good um, uh, good results from it. I think it's a good opportunity for our kids and for other kids coming to, uh, to the district. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Does anybody have any questions? How many years has it been $5,000? Is it, mm. I mean. For, for as long as I know. Um, I don't think so. No. I mean, we, we've, we've actually asked. Yeah. And we, I think, actually listed that as one of our legislative yeah. um, priorities a couple of years back. Um, there just didn't seem to be any willingness to, uh, to really look at it. Um, even like offline when we've had different uh, conversations with the DESI finance folks about like different grants and things like that. Um, they even acknowledge it's just an area that really hasn't been focused on. It's just, it's in there. It's in the, the um, I don't know if it's a policy or legislation that talks about the number, um, but it just hasn't, uh, hasn't changed. So I, I, you know, I'd love it to be more, but I'm not holding out any hope uh, that it's more. The other thing is, you know, we have students from Chelmsford who participate in school choice in other districts as well. So even though we're getting, say, 5000 for taking a student in, if that increased to 10000 and one of our children are going to another district, we'd be losing 10 there. Um, so, you know, it's it's a little bit of a trade-off. Uh, but we, we have sufficient space, particularly at the high school for next year. I think, again, it's a, it's a worthwhile program. And this would bring our numbers back to 40. And I think that's a good number to, to count on. That then gives us $200,000 of extra revenue that we can allocate within the budget if things come up where we want to um, to target uh, resources. And still going to the computers? Yes. So it goes to the revolving fund. And then what we have it earmarked in the budget against is the uh, the leases for the, um, the 101 initiative. Do we, are there 40 students from our district that go out? How many? I don't, I, I should have known that number, number before you asked. Do you happen to know the number? No. I can find out for you and send you an email. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. And that's, again, even for us, it's something that just has happened over time. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like we had like a, a, a bunch of students leave, but I'm sure we have a number that have always attended school choice in other districts. Um, and then we have kids that we've taken into our district. I think it's less than the 40, but it, is it less yeah, than I think I've seen yeah, the number. Yeah. I'll, I'll find out tomorrow morning for you and uh, shoot you an email. Um, I'd be surprised if it was more than. Yeah. I just don't know the exact yeah. number. I've seen the number before, but I think it'll. I'll find out for you. All right, Dennis, I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion to accept eight additional students at Chelmsford High School in grade nine and one additional student at Parker Middle School in grade five out of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts School Choice Program. Being the to bringing the total school choice participation in the Chelmsford Public Schools to 40 students during the 2024-25 school year. Second. All right. Is there any further questions or discussions? It's a roll call. It's a roll call. Okay. 
It's a roll call vote. Mm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dennis? Dennis? Yeah, I know. Hi. <laughs> Susan? Aye. John? Aye. Maria? Aye. Aye. Five in favor. Thank you very much. I'll report back um, the, the, the participation and interest we receive, just to let you know. Um, fourth uh, on the agenda under new business this evening is just approval of some uh, field trips. Uh, there are three before you this evening. I just want to call your attention to uh, the first one. Um, this is a trip you actually, this is for our um, students at uh, McCarthy Middle School to go to um, Quebec. Uh, you had approved this at the January 16th meeting, and the dates for the uh, trip had to change. So uh, the dates are moving from um, April 26th to 28th to uh, May 17th to 19th. Um, so you, we're just going to approve the, uh, the date change on that particular trip. And then we have the Theatre Guild at the high school uh, looking to go to an event in uh, Boston on March 21st to 23rd. Um, it's in-state, but it's overnight. That's why it's before you. And then uh, trying to do some pre-planning for a year from now. Um, this is the Chelsea High School students who are enrolled in uh, the French program. This is the cultural exchange program um, in the springtime of 25. Um, that's April 16th to 27th would be our group of high school students going to France. Um, so I'd recommend approval of those, um, both the modification and then those two new trips. One at one at a time? Uh, yeah, one at one at a time, please. All right. Uh, I make a motion to approve the field trip of McCarthy Middle School students enrolled in French to Quebec City, Canada from May 19th to 24th, 2024. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Zero in favor. I make a motion to approve the field trip of the Chelmsford High School Theory Guild to Boston, Massachusetts from March 21st to 23rd, 2024. Second. Questions? Concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Zero in favor. Sorry. I make a motion to approve the field trip for Chelmsford High School students enrolled in French to La Rochelle, France from April 16th to 27th, 2025. Any questions or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five I feel zero. Like I should take French, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is starting to rotate. So yeah. this happens to be the French trip, and then the year later will be the Spanish trip. What are we going to do for ASL learners? I don't know. We should probably work on that. Ah, soon. Interesting question. A, a lot of kids actually want to take ASL now, and there's no associated trip with it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I can't speak intelligently to this. I don't know that you would necessarily have to go out of the country. I don't know if there are, like, different places. I'm sure there's, like, a... Fancy college somewhere where they or RIT. where they like kind of yeah. yeah came up with like some kind of ASL type. Well, there yeah. are performances too. Yeah, there's performances. Yeah, ASL, so that's, that's true. Maybe like right. a New York thing or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we, uh, definitely we can look into that. It's a good, it's a good incentive. It's a good incentive to have kids take it. No, it is. I think the other ones you just kind of naturally think Spanish and French. You know, yeah, they go to another sense. country, but um, yeah, we'll have to think about there's that. There's experiences right. that they could go to have to do with the ASL. And like I how it improved the lives of people. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. That's a good idea. Um, and that's all I have for tonight on our new business. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we do not have anybody registered for our second public input session, correct? We don't. Okay. Um, so liaison reports, anything additional than what people had already talked about? Go ahead. Not to say. At the high school, then meeting tonight, um, and I can't attend because of this meeting, so they sent me a report. They did a staff appreciation welcome back from the break by leaving snacks in the house offices, the kitchen staff area, and the main office. They have two more events planned for staff appreciation. One will be funded by the district, and the other is funded through parent donations, and they will happen over the next six weeks. They're also very busy right now with after-prom planning. In the middle schools, I attended that meeting last night. Both of the PTOs were present. They had a really good showing. Um, they discussed extensively um, creating a STEAM fair mm. for the middle schools, hopefully for next year. They are looking for a couple of parents who like this area and want to work in this area um, to uh, come in and be the leads. So if you are interested in it as parents, please uh, reach out to the PTOs. Uh, Dr. Parks reported very happily on a successful seventh grade black light stance where over 250 students attended, which that's wonderful. And there were quite a few parents and staff uh, who um, chaperoned. 
And then Parker had its play that was reported uh, how well that went, and there were two casts, mm -hmm. and that meant a lot to them. Um, so really uh, kudos to that director who put that together because the greatest number got to participate. They are working now on their talent show, Showboat. May 18th will be the talent show, and that is being led by a parent. And the middle schools would like to host Katie Greer. And at this event last night, um, Council of Schools was present. And so um, Kate for that said to reach out to her because they would like to go ahead and fund a parent event if that's going to happen. Okay. Uh, and that's my report for that. All right. Does anybody else have any liaison reports? I do. Um, I attended CHIPS PTO early last week. Um, they just did a sock drive, which they said was really cool, like a way that the kids could really participate in something that helped out the community, but they brought in pairs of socks to be donated. And they said this was really great because even their littlest kids could kind of understand that, like toy drives they've had trouble with. The kids want to keep the toys, but they could kind of get it. They already have plenty of socks at home, right. but I can donate socks for some kid who might not. So they said that worked out really well. Um, the PTO does a real lot there with help supporting the theme weeks that they have in the school. They do things in the hallway there at CHIP so all the um, students can go through different, um, whatever the decorative things they have. But for instance, they've got an under the sea week planned for um, late May and the PTO helps fund having a photo booth there. So they do some nice things. They also use some PTO money to give teachers cash gifts, and the teachers were very grateful. They brought some things such as pretend play food, kinetic sand, books, live butterflies, um, new sensory equipment like sensory swing, um, and some other items. They did some garden games and ladybug games and beehive games, and but the teachers were really grateful that they have that um, money from the fundraising. Um, so great for the parents who participate in that. Their next big fundraiser is Square One Art which is a fun activity for the kids, but it also brings in some money. Um, at Harrington PTO last week, I went and followed the advice of the strategic plan DM group, and I actually talked to them about the strategic plan and just let them know that they can see it anytime they want. I showed them how to find it on the website, and because I'm in the academic group, I just talked a little bit about that, how we're um, working on improving students' math scores, and I had a conversation with them about iReady, and I actually have some feedback that I will share with my subcommittee next time we talk. So that was really helpful, and they seemed very interested to know that Good. we had that going on. Dennis? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, so just uh, CPAC is going to be holding several workshops on a new IEP, um, vir both virtual workshops. I believe the one on the March 21st is already filled up, but there's another on March 26th, so you can sign up through uh, the CPAC Facebook page, um, and then they're going to have their own workshops later on in the in the spring. Um, after attending a nice event that John was involved with, I get to also go and attend the center school uh, science fair, and I, I yes. act as a judge there, and it's great. The, the kids always do a great job. The people that put it on, they, they do so much work to get it organized and everything else, and you know, it was, it was nice to see. I get to do mostly first graders, so um, just to see that the thought process and what they like and what they don't like. So that was that was a fun event. And as Donna already mentioned, uh, she and I both had the opportunity last night to um, meet with the the, the uh, NEASC team um, just to talk about how things are going. So that was it was nice to nice to hear about the the feedback they're getting from the students about what they feel mm -hmm. Council High is about, and it was all very positive. So yeah. we did hear that. Yeah, I went to that science fair too. They had like ninety projects. Yeah, and I was very glad I only got assigned first grade. And it was down from last year. Yeah, <laughs> these elementary kids really throwing the curve for us. Oh, yeah. wow. I saw the most amazing thing: that Lego vacuum. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was great. It was great. Like this wow. big, yeah. and it was very powerful. And I was like, yeah. this man, this this young man, could market this thing for cars. Oh my god! Like just keeping your glove compartment to vacuum up. Yeah. <laughs> I was. It was Put them on Shark it Tank. It was, it was unbelievable. It was the, they, the whole, all of them yeah, were excellent. really terrific. Okay. Um, Did you have a question? Yes. Could you say what NEASC stands for, please? Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get rid of that. Nobody New knows. England Association School. Committee? Something. No. 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 New England Association of Secondary Schools. 
something. Yeah, I need. I need to write it down. It, it's okay because we keep on saying NIA, yeah, yes, for and it kind of occurred to me that people may not know what it is. It's our crediting program, right? However, schools. it is not part of DESI. No, no, it is not. It's okay. an outside right. okay. group that reviews high schools in order to accredit them as, you know, institutions of it's New England School. Association of Schools and Colleges. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. I was there. I was there. I we got to school. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was right. I've got the Google. Yeah, I just <laughs> as I said, we had mentioned it a few times tonight, and I'm not no, sure that's people. A, that's an excellent point. You know, know what that is. All right. Um, so um, I have a couple things. Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, I'd like to congratulate John on your um, town hall that you Thanks. held last night. Uh, not, oh, Jesus, last Thursday. Last week. Sorry. I get it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and um, it was phenomenal. Um, and if I, it was uh, post 9/11. Military service. Post 9-11, veterans, um, like, kind of how in your service inspired further service in the town, how right. it inspires more service. Right. Yeah. It was excellent. It was excellent. I very well attended, so. Yeah. No, I re yeah. was really grateful for the amount of people. Although my superintendent didn't show up, the town manager did show up. You were at a conference. I know. Yeah, I was really <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually, I just uh, really appreciate all the people that came out. Regina Jackson, a bunch of people from the town. Yep. Representatives came out, you and um, the chair of... Yeah. Um, select board. So it was a really well attended event. It was great. And we had it and got to speak about, although I didn't say his name, uh, you know, talking about Afghanistan, that people think war is really far away. And when Afghanistan ended, there was actually um, a Chelmsford High graduate in the airport during that whole um, evacuation. So during the, that two week emergency period, there was actually Chelmsford people there. So I just, it's the wars, you know, all this stuff is a little bit smaller than people think. It was yes, good. absolutely. Yeah. So um, congratulations to you and your Thank group you. for doing that. Um, so I have an announcement from um, Evelyn Thorne from the Arts and Technology Education Fund. Uh, so applications for the 24-25 school year are currently available. The deadline is March 31st. The staff of Chelmsford Public Schools are eligible to apply. Uh, the director of technology uh, has sent the um, applications and instructions to all staff. This year, the ATEF committee decided to expand to accept applications from clubs. Any past recipients are also required to submit a project summary sheet with, with any new application, and applications are also available on the town website. And then um, that is it for liaison reports. Does anybody have anything else? How about um, action items or new items? Just can we nail down a, a date to do a public forum yes. on the building? I mean, because, you know, I know we're going to do some maybe pre town meeting, but I think we'll we definitely do, do some pre town meeting. Yes, I am working on that. I'm just trying to figure out. I think McCarthy is the venue. I just want to find a night that we can actually do it and have it be recorded and everything. It'll be pinned down by this week. Okay. Just so we get the word out. Yeah. And, and we'll do a save the date and all of that. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and then also, um, Sam Poulton from the Neshoba um, <clears throat> Valley School Committee, Neshoba Tech school committee, um, was here, and he asked us to announce that uh, there will be a final debate on March 20th, that's a Wednesday, from 7 to 9.30 um, p.m. in the police training room at the police station. This um, particular debate will be um, <coughs> co-sponsored by the Republican uh, committee, uh, town committee, and the Democratic town committee. They'll both be working together, and it will be televised on Chelmsford Telemedia and um, it will also be broadcast on WCAP. And I think that's it. Um, do we have anything else? The <coughs> meeting for the show about thing, 25th, right? The 25th, that, uh, right. Okay. The 25th. Okay. I caused a problem with that because I saw it. <laughs> well, you at least made us figure it out. I have one meeting next week, correct? In a week, we're meeting again. No. No, um, I, the 26th. Two weeks. Two weeks. Right, two weeks. 26th. Yeah. yeah, so the next day we have that. Our isn't isn't the 26th next week? No, 19th is next week. Two more weeks. Two weeks from tonight. And I don't know, are we having an executive session? We got a request about? No. Okay. No, uh, we're going to um, allow, Dr. Lang will meet with that group. Okay. Okay. So I don't, I just want to know if it needs to be in my calendar. All right, anything else? All right, if there's nothing else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Five zero in favor. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. And tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Thank you. I think I can.